So hello everybody and welcome back to another TRU Talks and as you can see I have another guest with me today, it's rugby correspondent for the Times, Alex Lowe. So Alex, welcome to the show. I mean, how have things been for you and how has life been as a sports journalist that joined this very strange time? It has, well, it has been very strange. Um, sport is it's like a soap opera, isn't it? We have The narrative often gets created by the results at the weekend and the performances and that gives us a lot, of, a lot to talk about and dissect for the following week till we get to the next game. Of course, we've had no games, but the narrative hasn't stopped. Um, but unfortunately, it's been sort of off-field boardroom battles rather than on-field uh, rugby battles that we've had, we've had to, to report about for the last three, four months. Um, where do you begin with um, it's, it's, it's salary cap stuff, uh, salary cap reports and, and players falling out with clubs and clubs falling out with unions? Um, it's been a... You know, we haven't been short of news. If you look at some of the other sports around, you know, we should be in the middle of the cricket season. And it's been pretty, um, other than the frustration for cricket of not being able to play, there haven't been too many rows about it. Um, football, the reporting was all about how will they get back. And football was obviously leading the way um, in terms of trying to find and you know, navigate a path through to, to sport returning. And rugby has just been a battleground on every, everywhere you turn. There are arguments, there's indecision, uh, there's a lot of indecision, um, there are a lot of disagreements. And uh, I just think it paints a really bad picture. I mean, it's given us a lot to write about, um, but that isn't necessarily a good thing, really. It, it paints, you know, as a fan, a lover of the sport, I think it paints the sport in such a bad light. And I did a piece which went in Saturday's paper, which was looking back at 95, not on the World Cup, but the kind of the the row that was going on below the surface of that World Cup and the, the threat of a breakaway that Kerry Packer uh, and his organisation were, were trying to pull together. And, you know, the arguing hasn't stopped. Over 25 years of professionalism has been, has been infighting constantly. And one of the things that Bill Sweeney has said recently, and, and I think he's managed to pull together the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere around, a th or help pull together, I wouldn't give all the credit, but help, help a process that has got the unions of, of the game aligned. Because he's, try, he's making the point that you know, rugby's out there to compete with all other sports and it wants to show itself in its best light. And now, as it has done for 25 years, most of its, you know, most of its energy is spent competing you know, in, with itself. Um, you know, we now have clubs for country, uh, clubs for unions as, a, as the latest sort of skirmish. Um, so it's given us plenty to write about. It's made it a strange old time in in sports journalism with, with no sport to report on, but, but, but yeah, plenty of boardroom battles to keep us busy. Yeah, you, you use the word, uh, the term, Alex, there, of soap opera, and I think you're absolutely spot on. I mean, I don't think any of you, any of you who might have been over in Japan covering England's World Cup final could have imagined uh, what has gone on sort of in the seven months prior to South Africa lifting the, lifting the trophy. Oh, uh, it's, it's been, um, it was a, it's just been a, hot, a really weird, season since we came home from there because obviously you had the, the enormous high of um, uh, England reaching a World Cup final and the quality of rugby we saw and the stories that came out of it that you know the Japan story and, and um, England England New Zealand and, and you know you're watching the game at its peak and then honestly the day we land we, we knew through that last week 10 days in Japan that the Saracens salary cap decision had been made so we knew that was coming and we knew it was being delayed because if England had won the World Cup there'd have been a parade on the Tuesday I think following it um, England lost so the day we landed it got announced um, so you went from rugby being on this enormous high and everything about what England had done on the field um, and the you know the stories around the final and what didn't work out and all part of the of, of the sporting narrative, and then you land and you go from this, this great high to suddenly the Saracens' uh, decision is made, but then then you had four months of arguing over it, of, of Saracens initially um, threatening to appeal the the verdict, and and you, you went from that through to to the end result, which was which was that they they were found guilty and they had their punishment. And then the clubs decide the punishment wasn't enough and so effectively overruled the verdict and, and made their own uh, decision, which was ultimately 
telling Saracens to open their books or accept relegation, uh, for you know, which they obviously accepted. And then, then the only way to enforce the relegation under RFU rules was to then write a new rule that they were going to get 75 point deduction to guarantee they finish bottom. So we've had all you know, we had all of that to deal with. So massive kind of crashing come down from from the World Cup. Uh, Six Nations was improving. It started badly for England, but um, it was improving as a tournament and building to you know to what we hoped was going to be a, a decisive Super Saturday with at least two matches in which the, the title was was on the line. And obviously we never got there. Uh, meanwhile, we had uh, we had the Lord Miners review of the salary cap system. Uh, he effectively wrote them a, a, a new framework on how to modernise a system that was declared not fit for purpose. Within 10 days of that, the clubs had decided to lower the salary cap and write, write some new rules, which allowed them to, to then buy themselves 10 days to, to, to um, effectively... They will argue it's not a loophole because it's in the regulations, but they built themselves a system which allows clubs to be 25% over the salary cap the new salary cap, if they can afford it. Well, like six months ago, they were relegating Saracens for being over the salary cap because they could afford it. So all they've done is, in my view, legitimise um, clubs who you know break in that salary cap if they can afford it, which I just think is, you know, it, we've just lurched from, from the, the, the wonderful high of Japan and the whole two months to, um, to from one scandal after another one row after another and it's been you know they're, they're determined to finish this season and they will finish this season but the season was already so horribly scarred by the Saracen situation and the inevitable sort of come down you get post World Cup that um they just want to get it out of the way and, and move on. I don't think don't think they could cancel the season but they just need to get it finished. It won't be one that'll be remembered. You know, I think whoever wins it, there will be an asterisk above their name, whatever happens, because because of everything that's, that's happened. And, and it's sort of such an artificial season now. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's not been a, it's, it's not been a great year for rugby, that's for sure. Since, since we left Japan anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more on that, Alex. And just to sort of maybe start on the, on the salary cap issue. And um, you actually tweeted uh, a couple of weeks ago in the style of Craig David of a writing saying about sort of the week in rugby. And I think it sums up perfectly in terms of this strange time. And as you say there, how much of a tough year it's been for rugby. Just sort of how did that week develop for you? Were you just so bemused and sort of aghast of what had been, what was happening between these clubs and players during a time where you feel that rugby really needs to pull together? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was. Uh, it, it, it's a difficult. It's obviously a diff- if you if you're running a business at the moment, it's really hard because you have personal relationships with your staff um, that you're trying to protect and do the best for them. But ultimately, there's no money coming in. Decisions have to be made, and I think everyone gets that. I, I, what I don't understand about rugby is it, is why there is we, we always find ourselves in a position where everyone's at loggerheads and nobody recognises the value of, of working together. Um, and, it, and it always seems to come down to, to communication and consultation or, or a lack of it. Um, we had at the start of the process, the clubs decided to implement a temporary pay cut. And while some clubs dealt with it better than others, there was no consultation with the players' union. Um, and the clubs would argue that there is no collective bargaining like they would have in the United States, for example. So, you know, the PRL, uh, the PRA, the RPA, as they now are, um, felt they should have been consulted by the Premiership over the temporary cuts. Uh, the clubs themselves operate as individual businesses and had to do their own thing. So immediately you had a, system, a disjointed system. That, um, and, and so those, those pay cuts were imposed. And as we know, at Leicester in particular, they went and sought legal advice. Um, it sort of accelerated the idea of this breakaway union. Mm. And then two, three months down the line, salary cap gets reduced. I think we all saw that coming. But again, the RPA felt that they deserved some consultation about what the ramifications of that would be. Um, they weren't consulted. And so from memory, they, they voted the salary cap down on the Monday. Um, they didn't announce it publicly till the Wednesday. But on the Tuesday, it was already very clear that 
So we all knew what had been decided on the Monday. Uh, Premiership Rugby and the clubs just couldn't, they didn't want to announce it yet. And there are various theories as to why, whether it was wrangling over the wording or buying themselves some time to do what they they needed to do, which was having agreed this 25% sort of um, caveat, if you like. Mm. Uh, any contract, so that they, they came up with a date of, of uh, June the 18th, any contract that had been signed before them um, could, uh, was, was permitted to, you know, only 75% of that would count under the new cap. Sorry, this is all really kind of complicated. But we go from, you know, from Monday, that's agreed, and we all know it. Tuesday, suddenly it becomes really clear that they're going to start pushing through um, salary cap, uh, salary cuts or new contracts which contain salary reductions. Mm. Wednesday, they announce it. Thursday, uh, uh, Wednesday, it's, it, it's announced, but the RPA have also gone public by them, uh, really critical of the clubs. Thursday, PRL inform the players' union they will no longer speak to them about it. Friday, the clubs say we're cutting off all communication. Um, and it's, you know, it's just a remark, it's remarkable that, that the, the, the prized assets of the game can be tr- treated in that sort of without sort of disdain. Now, I, I do I, I put an asterisk next to my comments a little bit because most of us, you know, that I, I work for the Times, we haven't yet had pay cuts, we weren't put on furlough. I know other news organizations, it, they, they did, were put on furlough, or other businesses have had redundancies, and 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 those consultations maybe, maybe didn't happen with their union. Um, you know, so in some ways, I always think that players. You know, they're like any other member of staff and um, we often sort of hold them up at a higher level because they're sportsmen but you know they have to realize that this is a business and the business is failing mm. um, however having said that um, the structures are there to allow kind of open communication and none of that happened so you've had you know and it's still rumbling on um, with, with some cl- some players having not accepted new contracts um, and it's just, it just just comes down to communication and and the constant lack of it in in the game um, among governing bodies and and, and executives. It, you know, it, it never ceases to amaze me how hard it seems to be for them to pick the phone up and just say, you know, listen, these, there's a real danger here. Clubs are going to go to the wall. Can we work with you so that the players? This is I'm hypothesising from the from the the PRL and the clubs to the RPA. Just work with us. To help us get this, you know, get the players to understand that we we could go out of business here. Yeah, you know, and and that just didn't happen, and and therefore everyone was at loggerheads from the start, um, and and still are to, to a great degree. Are we are we sort of seeing the fallout from that now, Alex? Over the last couple of weeks, I mean, a number of clubs, especially last week, I mean, the emails we were receiving from the Premiership and the clubs themselves, our players resigning and players going out on loan. Is that sort of the fallout? Do you think from that? Yeah, it is. So the re-signing, a lot of that has been rushed through um, so that there are contracts that, are, that are, um, are at a reduced level but can still count as 25% above the salary cap from clubs that can afford it. Other clubs have had to, to rush those through because they, they desperately need to save 25% on every player. Um, I think if you look at Gloucester in the last few months, um, we reported... A while ago now that Franco Moster was leaving, um, that's now been confirmed. Mm. That's, what, 400 grand a year, maybe more, off the salary cap, um, off the salary bill, sorry. Um, they've lost David Humphreys and they've lost Johan Ackerman. Uh, lost, you know, lost, something they chose to go. Situation wasn't working. So they, they have saved somewhere in the region of a million, a million and a half pounds. Right. Just in, in those three going. Um, and then, ironically, they recruit George Skivington from London Irish to, be head, co- that. <laughs> to be head coach. And, and, and bingo, another row breaks out. And it's a row over, over protocols not being followed, according to London Irish. Gloucester say they were, but they had no communication from London Irish. And then it's impossible to notice the irony of, of now clubs arguing over protocols not being followed when the players themselves have been saying, protocols have not been followed over the salary cap reduction because not the cap reduction over the salary reduction 
because the, even the temporary reduction was a was a breach of contract for every player in the league. Um, so yeah, we lurched from one round to another. Um, but yeah, so a, a, a lot of the loan moves are really from Saracens, and they're slightly different because they're going down. Yeah. So. Izzy Equi's off to Northampton and, and uh, Bristol have picked up a couple of good ones. And um, that's a slightly different scenario to, um, to, to some of the other contract announcements that have come, come through, yeah. And uh, one of the, the reasons we got in touch with you, Alex, was around sort of the Times' reporting when PRL decided to bring in PWC. Um, and we sort of, we, we all know what their involvement was with Maro Otoji and his and his rights towards the end of last year in sort of PRL were like, no, we're not going to keep using PWC if it's right and they're saying because of the cost of them. So when they do bring them in at this time when clubs seem to be on the knees, it seems to be a lot of bemusement when the story broke. Yeah, um, I mean, I was bemused when I heard it for exactly that reason. I, I don't understand how an organisation whose sole purpose is to run the league what, don't have the expertise to be able to run the league. I accept they don't have as many people as, as the Premier League have you know, for, for, for their restart and there's a lot of work being done. Um, but, I, yeah, when I heard that, I was, I was amazed because we all know how much PwC costs. And, and let's, let's, let's just be generous and assume that, that they've given them a discount or a deal's been done. You're still talking hundreds of pounds an hour for, for, for staff members, you know, management consultants at, at PwC, minimum hundred pounds an hour, hundreds of pounds an hour. Uh, for management consultants to come in. Um, now, Premiership Rugby's response was, well, we've got, to, we've got to get this right. We can't make any mistakes here. Absolutely, of course, of course not. Um, it has to be done right. Uh, but they do have more time than any other sport. They've got, they've got loads of examples now in, uh, from football in, in, in England and, and, and Germany, how football's come back and, and how they've done it and all the things that need, need to be done. And it is complicated. And, uh, and it's expensive. You know, there's no word yet from Premiership Rugby on testing. You know, who, you know have they bought the tests yet? They won't say. Um, you know, what, what, one of the challenges that we have as reporters at the moment is that the, the flow of information from Premiership Rugby is, is virtually zero. Um, so when you, even when you, you, know, you hear something and you, want, you might want to, to get a response or, or check it, you can't engage with them. Or, um, on the, which is, makes it very hard because all we're trying to do is is report what's happening. Um, mm. Now I got I did get a response from them on, on PwC and it was it was along the lines of we have to get this right and we need we need the best advice from experts uh, in in the field of of dealing with dynamic and fast moving projects. Um, it just looks very very expensive way of doing it to me at a time when clubs are facing going to the wall. Players are having to take pay cuts, um, you know, and they're the star assets of, of the league. The league doesn't survive without them, um, and yet there's enough money to, to spend on PwC for two months. Um, I didn't really buy the full explanation. You know, I, I feel that, as some people said to me, you know, if, if there was a shortage of, of of staff because they're trying to deal with the, the, the global league uh, on one hand and deal with the RPA on the other hand and deal with project restart again you know that's a lot of work um but is pwc the most cost effective way of doing it um you know that that's before you mentioned the fact that on the accounting side of pwc the, the auditing side sorry there have been issues um at wasps um and obviously yes yeah, they were involved in the, their uh, their estimation of, of maritoji's um image rights was uh was, was, was a key factor in 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 that salary cap breach um so uh I, I i find i found it staggering when i heard about it and i'm not i wasn't surprised by the reaction you know on, on social media as you say i, was, I dropped a, a tweet on it and you know it was it, it was i just laid out the facts as i understood them and um a lot of people seem to feel the same as me that there was a um what wasn't the way i expected prl to be trying to manage project restart at a time when when the, the game's in financial crisis mm. And you mentioned there, Alex, that you were able to get a response around the PwC issue. But mm. we had Rob Kitson and uh, Brendan Fanning from the Irish Independent on, on the show at the start of the month. And they said exactly what you said, that the lack of communication has been 
stadium for a Premiership would be. And I guess in Ireland, maybe Brendan's a bit more relieved because we're seeing a bit of results coming out from the provinces around COVID-19 testing. But as we sit here, probably a month and a half before the season's supposed to start, there's been sort of no word on that side of things. No, I, I find it... Um, and and we, we find it with often with lots of different uh, governing bodies really that I feel they forget who they, who they represent right? they forget who the game is for um, you know PRL is now run by uh, the chief executive Darren Charles was brought in from UK TV he surrounded himself by uh, people he knew from UK TV and that world um, and the sense is that he was you know, his TV background put him in a really good position to negotiate the, the next television deal. And there's one year left on, on the BT deal. Um, and that, and it feels like the focus from Premiership Rugby has simply been on CBC and, and, the, and, and BT. They forget that you know, there are thousands of people who, who follow the sport. It's, it's the people's game. And, you know, let's not be beats about the bush here it's, it's not the game isn't owned by premiership rugby or darren childs the game exists because of the people who will go through the gates and buy the television packages and there are thousands and thousands more rugby fans in, the, in this country than premiership rugby fans so it's not just that we're not just talking about the twenty thousand who go to welford road or the fifteen thousand who who go to the rec you know there are Thousands of people like like myself who love the sport don't have an attachment to a premiership club but would still watch it, would still go to games, would still pay for my subscriptions. All these people are just left with, you know, we're, you know without sounding too grand about it, we're trying to inform the rugby public about what's happening with their sport. Mm. And there's, like, there's no information coming down or, or very little communication about... Um, about what their intentions are, what what they're hoping to do, what what they're planning to do, um, and that just makes it difficult to keep the public informed. And I think the RFU had have had some difficulties with that recently, um, in, in the recent past. Uh, in the last couple of months, I think Bill Sweeney has shown um, some some strong leadership in in explaining what is what they're working towards, mm. and almost out trying to outline the options. Um, not necessarily pinning his colours to any one mask, but it's important that the people know what, what, what's being worked on in their sport. It's important that the fans know, and, and in terms of the premiership, yeah, they, they don't know. I mean, I, just look at the, the global season argument at the moment, yeah, uh, yeah. which is the, the, North and the Northern Hemisphere Unions and Southern Hemisphere Unions are now are unified for the first time in 25 years, really. It's now down to the French clubs and English clubs. Now, the French clubs have done a, an economic impact study on why they don't want rugby in August. Mm. They've written to World Rugby uh, demanding a seat at the table um, in a letter that was co-signed by the Premiership, and yet I've not seen an English language version of that letter. Um, they have written, they wrote to their clubs, Top 14 and Pro D2 clubs last week or the week before, outlining uh, what happened at the World Rugby Meeting and explaining why they have such objections to what, Rob, what World Rugby want to do and also explaining what the club's proposal was. Not heard a single word on that from Premiership Rugby. Mm. So, and, and that letter that, that um, Paul Goes wrote, he's the president of the LNR, the French clubs, uh, to, to the clubs in France, outlined the Premiership's objection to summer rugby in a way that the Premiership haven't yet outlined themselves. Um, you know, and, and, and we had, you know, then, then last week we had Bill Sweeney from the RFU saying that, the Premiership, that summer rugby was PRL's proposal. So the whole thing just blows you up. Like, if Bill Sweeney's accurate, and I have no reason to say he wouldn't be, he said on the BBC that it was PRL's proposal. Why are PRL now objecting, it, uh, objecting to it? But doing so, what feels like in the shadow of the French, rather than actually making that point themselves. Mm. So that's just from a journalist perspective. I know that the fans out there aren't interested in the process of how we get news. But you know what you want to be able to do is if you if you pick up some news, you talk to somebody, you want to be able to double check it. You want to be able to run it by 
people to, to um, invite them to respond. And there, there needs to be a flow of communication because ultimately we're trying to just tell the fans what's, what's being planned and what's happening. Mm. And it's really hard to do at the moment. Yeah, and I was going to touch on sort of the, the global calendar just to finish off, Alex. I know um, you mentioned the French clubs there. I think Stephen Jones wrote a piece for the Times over the weekend about sort of how, I mean, it's eye water and how much money French rugby have said they will lose if it does go, uh, if they do play summer rugby. I think if I'm right in saying there is an announcement expected tomorrow, uh, the 30th of June, around, around this sort of subject. So how do, how do you see it sort of going? Because it doesn't seem, as all of these things at the moment, that is very clear at the moment. Well, yeah, so tomorrow um, being Tuesday, there's a World Rugby Council have a vote, but it's, a, it's, it's focused on what happens this, this autumn. Right. So they want to ex- extend the Regulation 9 window, i.e. the window when international rugby has first call on the players so, to run from the end of October through to into December. So I think make it a seven-week window to try and, try and squeeze in some test matches. That will obviously cause some rows with the clubs. Feels like feels to me 24 hours out from that vote that they, they're fairly close to reaching um, an, an arrangement that, that works. Uh, I saw that the French clubs had agreed to five tests for the French. Right. It doesn't quite work for the, this kind of expanded Six Nations competition that they've been talking about. Um, but I feel that they, it feels like they're, cl- they're fairly close. Um, but there's a long way to go to, to kind of create permanent harmony between the unions and, and the clubs. Um, I, I spoke to Rob Andrew last week as part of this piece I did on, on to 95 and the links between then and now. And, you know, he was in the middle of the club country row, first with Newcastle and then as rugby director of the RFU. And he just said, listen, frankly, some of these problems are unsolvable, he said. Right. It's, it's so complicated. Um, with TV deals and commercial interests um, between clubs and country, that some of these issues are, are unsolvable. And, and Bill Sweeney himself said they get to 80% um, of the way there in terms of agreement, then he'll be happy. So the latest that, that we'd heard and that Bill Sweeney's pointing is working towards is a club season in the north that runs from December to July, uh, which is obviously much shorter than. The existing club season. Yeah. Um, but the problem with that is you get to July and then August off, August and September off, October, November for this new international window. That's a lot of months with no club rugby. Um, and I can understand why, why clubs, as we started the conversation, their businesses, they need people through the doors. Um, they need sponsors engaged. They need pints being bought at Kingston Park or wherever. You know, Newcastle could go eight, ten, ten months without a game. Um, that's just brutal for their business. Um, so I, I understand that, you know, the, the, the club's perspective on it. And they won't get 100% alignment. It's, it's just impossible to do. Um, the French cannot play through August. They refuse to because, you know, the French culture, business culture, is they, they go on holiday for a month. So they're looking at, um, you know, I think the season sometimes starts right at the end of August in France. But, you know, they don't want to be playing through those months. So those conversations will, will go on for, for a while yet. Um, their priority at the moment is to, to try and solve this autumn um, and work out the scheduling for, for the, the Premiership final, which, uh, just, you know, which I was told was going, to, was going to be on October the 10th. I'm now hearing that might have moved because the options if they're held on October the 10th, they either have to play midweek games every round, every week, for five weeks has to be Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, or, um, you know, Tuesday, Saturday, Wednesday, Sunday, whatever. Um, or they drop matches, but they don't want to do that. So mm-hmm. it now sounds like they're going to push that final back till later in October. But then you've got the Champions Cup final and you've got England still want to play the Barbarians. I don't understand why, but they do. Um, you know, there must be a TV thing. I mean, that's a, why would you want to play that game? You know, especially if you've got no fans, there's just no point. As far as I can see, uh, and then and then you're into the autumn with a six a rearranged Six Nations game, and then whatever kind of structure they can they can implement for for October and November. Um, that's the priority for World Rugby at the moment. The, the longer term is what they do really for 2022. I don't see a global calendar bedding in next year. Right, I have, ste- I have steps towards it 
in the sense that the Premiership won't start till November, December, because it can't, um, uh, because its final won't be till the end of October. Um, so that, you know, in, in a sense, that'll be similar. But the Lions Tour now looks likely to go ahead in the summer. So it'll be sort of some tentative steps towards a global season, but it won't be, um, it, I don't think it'll come in fully till 2022 at the earliest. Um, and then it brings, it just opens up loads of other questions about, you know, what, what's the future of the Lions if the international window is now October and November, which World Rugby have identified as being a sort of a Super League type competition where everyone, you know, the top, the latest plan is your top three in the Six Nations and the top three in, in the rugby champion, in the expanded rugby championship would meet and there'd be a final, you know, create a new competition. But if, how do you run that? When the lions are away, I don't. That hasn't yet been been explained to me. And then, of course, if if the Premiership was to move anywhere away from its current window, anywhere, like even if it was to only move to a November or December start, you have to ring fence the league. And that ends the conversation because you can't. You would. I don't believe they'll move the Championship with it. The everything the RFU has said in the last six months has been about. Um, a reduction in funding of the championship. Uh, it was put to them when they briefed about it and, sh- and showed their, their figures that it would force those clubs to go semi-professional. In the cha- lots of championship clubs, semi-pro. Done that, yeah. And they accepted that. Uh, they accepted that would be one of, one of the knock-on effects. And so all the, all the talk from the RFU has indicated that, that the championship is the top level of the amateur game, not the second level of the professional game. So it's unlike in France where they have top 14, Pro D2. So if you move the premiership to start in December and you don't move the championship, then you can't have promotion relegation. It, it just is impossible. So that, that is another impact of, of this is that it would look like that, that process is now starting to accelerate. Um, I think there are a lot of club owners who want it, as we know. Um, you know and if it happened immediately, then Saracens would end up not going down. It, I don't think it won't happen immediately. So I think Saracens will play their year in the championship and then on the basis that they probably win the championship. But frankly, I don't think it'll matter because they're a shareholder. They can just break, they can go and join their own break league. Away, yeah. They'll just join their own league because they're a PRL shareholder. But, you know, there'll be no more promotion relegation between the top two, as far as we can tell. As far as we can tell. Um, so that's, that's, those are all the issues that... <laughs> that are around and, and, so, and some of the questions and and that's just the way it's heading but there are no definitive answers yet and that's one of the things we're trying to we're trying to just provide a, a sort of a commentary on 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 where the game's going and when we get some definitive answers then we try and bring them to everyone but it's you know there's a lot going on and we all just would you know I, I, we're enjoying the rugby the super rugby at the moment because I was going to say that's a positive that we can enjoy just rugby isn't and it and it's actually been you know Fitz, Sean Fitzpatrick was saying to me as part of that piece I did, you know, he said, I never thought I'd love watching a game of rugby that had 30 penalties in it. But actually, I really am, he said. And part of that is because the game's back. Mm. And we're just enjoying the game being back. And part of it is that, you know, those penalties are being brought about because it's, you know, th- th- there's it's positive intent. You know, the turnover's galore on the floor at the moment. We, we can see that. And I think that'll calm just as players get used to some of the small rules they're playing you know, like no second movement on the floor. Players are so used to the tackle player, you know, wrestling a bit and try, you know, trying to gain a bit more ground or delaying that the, the support then doesn't have to be there in a split second because they know the player on the ground will do his bit. Well, you know, the, the player on the ground is now being given no second movement, no chance to do anything. So that's why there was a load of turnovers early. Um, I think it's been great to watch. And, and now I'm fascinated this weekend coming with, with Super Rugby Australia and, and the, the laws that they're trialling. Um, 50-22 kick, for example. I was at, I was at the World Rugby uh, Symposium in Paris two years ago where that was first proposed. Um, Scott Johnson, who was then working in Scotland, obviously now in Australia, yeah. was a big fan of it. Um, and the, the theory, as, as, we, as you know, I'm sure, is, is you know, if, you, if you can execute a 50-22 kick, then the defending team's got to drop players back. So, if, so you can't defend the 14 in the line. There's more space. World Rugby liked it because they think it will reduce the number of head-on collisions 
uh, create a bit more space and make and, and bring a balance between evasion and, and contact in, in the game. And they've got loads of others. Um, the, the goal line dropout, you know, if you're the defending team and you hold, hold the ball up over, over your own line, the defending team now gets rewarded instead of the, the attacking team getting the five meter scrum, you get the goal line dropout. Um, it's been trialed. I think the idea is to, to cut cut the number of the amount of time being used up by scrums, mm. which is controversial because scrums are incredibly important. Um, but it's also designed to to reduce the number of pick and goes right on the line because that's just that's just that's that's players diving really low for the line, which means that the defending teams getting even lower. There's a lot of potentially dangerous collisions going on there, and World Rugby are just trying to trying to reduce that number. So, again, don't know if it'll, if it'll work. You know, you could argue that if you're the, the attacker team and you get, you get that close, you just held up over the line, you deserve another go. So, yeah. it'll be fascinating to watch how, the, how those laws play out. Um, so, yeah, we've got some rugby to watch at least um, while we wait for, for, for the Northern, Northern Hemisphere to sort of sort, their, sort themselves out and, uh, and uh, for PwC to help them get the game back on the road. Yeah, absolutely, Alex. Well, I'm sure we're all looking forward to the Super Rugby continuing in New Zealand. And obviously, as you quite rightly say, starting up again in Australia on the weekend. And we will see, hopefully, some small tentative steps this week from World Rugby towards uh, this this autumn. So, Alex, it's been a pleasure to chat to you. Thank you for, for letting me prize all that information out of you. Obviously, do follow Alex on Twitter. He's at Alex M. Lowe. He'll be bringing you all the latest from the Times and do check out the Times website. Some fantastic rugby content on there. But many thanks for Alex for joining us today. And that's been another episode of TRU Talks. Cheers, Alex. Cheers. Thank you.